And to bring us the word is none other than our very own Pastor Janet Wamaida Karyuki. Come on, let's just bless the Lord and encourage her as she comes. And Pastor Janet will be picking up and proceeding on the study of Ruth. Remember, a couple of weeks back, we embarked on our studies through the book of Ruth. And so we'll allow her to carry on from there. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Isige, for this opportunity. Praise the Lord. Good afternoon. I trust you are well. And those who are coming back after COVID, uh, the COVID break, long COVID break, Karibuni sana, into the presence of the Lord you have missed. Pastor Tabi started us on, the, on a series of Ruth. She took the first two sessions, and I'm going to carry on from where she left. So uh, I've titled my sermon, uh, The Love Story of Ruth and Boaz. And as you can notice, I have put the love story in brackets because you can't expressly, it's not, the Bible does not say it's a love story. They just tell us about Ruth and Boaz. But personally, me, I saw sparks. I saw love. And I'll let you judge. As I tell you the story, I'll let you judge if it's, a, uh, if it's the love story of Ruth and Boaz, Amma, it's just Ruth and Boaz. And because it goes from chapter 2 to 3 and to 4, allow me not to read, but allow me to tell you the story. So um, my first assignment, even as I tell you the story, is to make you see what I saw. You know, those two sparks and that lo love story. So Ruth, Ruth is a Moabite. So she, uh, she married, when she was in her land in Moab, she married foreigners, foreigners from, from Israel. They were Jews. But unfortunately for her, the husband died. And uh, what made it even worse, the death of the husband, is that the father to the husband had also died. So in these societies, this was a very patriarchal society, where your identity was really uh, tied to a male. You know, it might be your father, if you're not married, or your husband. You know, and if you're not... Uh, if you're a widow, it would be tied to, you know, a father-in-law or a, a brother, a, a brother to your husband or something like that, or an uncle, you know. So it was really a bad state for them. So she, she's there with her sister who also had lost the husband and a mother-in-law, you know, just three women trying to find life. And Ruth decides, sorry, Naomi, the mother-in-law, decides to go back to her land. And Ruth, I will not go to that details because Pastor Tab stayed there decided to accompany her mother. So she looked at this woman. This is not a young woman. You know, she's on her own. If I let her go back to her homeland alone, who will fend for her? You know, she decided two widows are better than one. So she, you know, out of, that is such a selfless act. She goes back with her mother-in-law to, to the land of Israel, to Bethlehem. And now she becomes a foreigner, a foreigner, a widow, you know. And a little bit poor at that, you know, because they, the God had prospered this land uh, and they had harvest. But remember, they were not there, so they did not plant, you know, so they had really nothing, you know. So it was quite a miserable state, you know, for Ruth. So when they land in this land, I'm sure she figures out, I need to do something or else we'll starve of hunger. So one day she wakes up and tells her mother-in-law, she might have heard maybe from the husband or from Naomi, her mother-in-law, that in this land of Israel, the, their God, Yahweh, had commanded that when you're harvesting, you don't harvest at the ages. You know, that one you leave for the poor of the society and the foreigners of the society who have nothing. Also, when you're uh, harvesting the land and some of it falls on the ground, they were also uh, commanded, this is, you can find from the book of Leviticus chapter 19, not to pick, you know, so that those who do not have anything can come and pick and find something to harvest. So Ruth comes to the mother-in-law and is like, allow me to go and find somebody who will be generous, you know, to let me glean. It was called gleaning, gleaning in their land. And so she takes off and goes, you know, and finds a land and asks for permission. And these guys allow him to glean after the harvesters, you know, and she follows. So there were the harvesters, the male harvesters and the female harvesters, and she was gleaning behind them. So she works really hard. You know, those times are not like the days today. Today at the end of the week, for some of us at the end of the month, we get a salary. When you live in an agricultural, purely an agricultural town, you know, or mostly an agricultural town, your source of income is harvest time. Harvest time passes and, you know, you lose until the next harvest time. You'll basically have nothing. So Ruth, having that in mind, she goes 
and she gets permission to glean as she gleans with all her heart. She's really working hard, knowing she needs to fend not only for herself, but also for her mother-in-law. She works very hard. And we are told she only takes a small break, but she really works hard. So, uh, uh, so she ends up, this, uh, it, it turns out that this farm that she's gleaning from is for a man called Boaz. A man, we are told, uh, a man of good standing in society. He also was wealthy, but he was also a man of integrity you know, of character, respectable in the society. So looks like Boaz decided to go through town first, went to Bethlehem, you know, and then he came a little bit later to the, to the farm. And he greets all the workers, we are told. He says, God be with you. And they respond to him. And then he notices Ruth. Possibly notices Ruth because he knew all his laborers. He knew all his servants. And I'm like, this is not my servant. And possibly notices her because... Uh, she also know, he also knows rather, Boaz knows the general people who come to glean the poor in society. And she's like, this one I've never seen, you know, in the land. But it's possible that he also noticed Ruth because Ruth was looking very nice. He had something, you know, he's sort of like that girl. So that is a possibility. That's how I see it. So, and then he asks, not how he, well, the question he asks, he asks the, the harvesters who are there since morning, who does this woman belong to? It's possible, that's how, that's how they used to ask people, you know, if you see a woman, you ask who does he belong to, because it was a patriarchal society. But also maybe he was trying to find out, is she taken? That's how I saw it. So, he, she saw this is a Moabite, she came, the story of how she came, and you know, she's a widow, blah, blah, blah. But they add and say, this woman has been working hard since she came, but then she's just been working and taken a little bit rest. So Boaz decides to approach her, goes to approach her, I'm sure says shalom or the greetings of you know that time oh lord be with you and then tells her you're welcome to this farm and the bible tells her tells her that boss tells him you don't need to go and glean in any other field this field you can come every day until the end of the the harvest you know and more than that you can you can even drink water you don't have to come with your own water or bother to fetch water the water the men draw to for them to drink you can also partake a very generous man you know a very kind-hearted man Boaz was, but maybe he had some motivation. He liked the chick. That is how may I say it. So, uh, Ruth goes back, or oh, Ruth, after she's told that, that she can come, she sees that as kindness, and she bows herself, you know, in front of Boaz and says, Boaz, who am I? You know, I'm only a st uh, stranger. You know, I have found favor in your eyes. And Boaz says, it's because of what I've heard. I've heard of how you treated your mother-in-law. You know, how you left your own land and left your family to come with this old woman to a land you don't know to fend for her. And then after that, Ruth goes back to gleaning. Boaz, I'm sure, goes supervising his work. And then lunchtime comes. And at lunchtime, this society, I don't think men and women ate together. So the male, um, maybe the male harvesters were eating there. And the female harvesters were eating there. And you remember, Ruth was not a hired help or a servant. So really, she did not have rights to come and eat with them. But Boaz, being the kind man he is, goes to Ruth and tells Ruth, please come and eat up. You can share with our bread and dip even it in the, in the vinegar, in the wine vinegar, whatever that is. I would not understand. Anyway, vinegar is nasty for me. So I don't know. Maybe it was very nice. So she dips. So I'm thinking, the men are seated there, the women are seated there. We are told more than just inviting her to have lunch. Uh, Boaz offers her. We actually told Boaz goes to Ruth. Remember, they're not seated together. Boaz goes to Ruth and offers her some of the roasted, uh, roasted corn. Mind him, chomo. As in offers, you know. You want to tell me that is still kindness? So you think it has crossed like a certain boundary, you know. I was telling people in the first service, I come from Kitali, an agricultural town. So when you're harvesting the basic food, every time your people have come to harvest in your land, you boil gideri. You boil beans and means, and that is the basic food everybody is uh, fed on. But if you're a child of the farmer, there's usually a special diet of soda and half loaf. So this is an instance where he had, him being the boss, maybe had some special diet of roast maize or roast corn, you know, and goes and shares. That's why me, I'm seeing here, this dude is just not a stu he's just, there's some fire and sparks here. So, after that, they eat. Actually, we are told she was given so much that she ate to her fill and even carried some 
home, which she shared with her mother-in-law, Naomi. So the, uh, after lunch, she go, Ruth goes back to gleaning. Boaz, it's like he has not done enough. He goes again to the workers and tells the workers, this lady will be coming to glean here every day. You know, but as she comes to glean, you know how the, before you harvest, you put, you cut and put them in sticks. You remember the story of Joseph, the ones that bowed, they were gathered together. So the, the law was as you harvest and it drops, that is what is left for the poor and the foreigners. But Boaz says, go ahead and leave some of the, the stalks without harvesting from them, you know, to make sure Ruth goes home with a good package. So Ruth uh, gleans and, and, you know, because of that, she goes home with so much, you know. So at the end of the day, when she goes home and her, mother's, her mother-in-law, Naomi sees how much she goes. She's like, wow, that is a lot of gleaning, even if it's gleaning, you know. And therefore, Ruth narrates the story. I went to this farm. There was this gentleman called Boaz who was really kind to me. He let me eat with them. He let me drink their water, you know. And actually told me I can be coming to glean in that farm until the end of the harvest. So Naomi was like, I know that guy Boaz is our relative. And he says he has continued with his kindness. So it's true that Boaz is a kind person, you know. I just feel that he was extra motivated. But his nature is that he's a kind guy. So I'm sure Ruth goes to bed after the day. I'm sure she has worked so hard, you know, she has gleaned, she has winnowed, you know, and she's there in the bed and she's tired. But she's just thinking, you God of Israel, you're a good God. You have prospered my journey today, you know. I have gotten a lot today and not only that, there's a land I can go, I feel I can go every day to winnow from that. And then she thanks God and then her mind drifts a little bit and she's like, why that guy? He's such a kind guy. I but me, I think there's something. You notice how he shared with me his lunch. He kept coming, coming. You know, come, welcome, come, have maize, come, have lunch. She's thinking, I maybe there's something. But then she talks herself out. She's like, I'm just a foreigner. What are the chances? You know, that's, you know, a man of such good standing in society would even look my way. So she decides, ah, I don't think so. There is nothing there. I can also imagine, Bo- but this is not in the Bible. I can also imagine Boaz. He goes home after a very long day of supervising. And she's like, wow, that God has blessed us. You remember before that there was farming? You know, the year before that, she's like, wow, I can't believe how God has blessed us with bumper harvest. She's just there thanking God. And then she remembers this girl, man, what a kind woman. You know, as such a hard working. She was not bad to look at, you know. But then Boaz, we are told in the Bible, was not a young man. So he's like, there's not a chance. I don't have a chance with this young girl. There is no way she thinks the same way I'm thinking. So because of both of them talking themselves out, the story dies. We are told, because remember this was the beginning of the harvest season. And the harvest season continues. The Bible just said, so Ruth continued going to that field. And we hear no story. So I'm imagining Ruth at home. She had a story. And then it's like that story died. But thank God for you, Ruth. I mean, sorry, Naomi. Thank God for Naomi, the mother-in-law. You know, she was a wise woman. So she's seen the story dying, but even her, she's thinking maybe there's something. So she goes and gathers information about Boaz. And she's told Boaz, now it's the end of the harvest season. They are threshing, you know, cleaning up the grain so that they can store it, you know, for, the, for, the, for storage so that they can use it throughout the season until the next harvest. So she comes to Naomi with a story. So she's like, oh, you're my daughter-in-law. You're a lovely woman. I'd like you to settle in a family. This guy called Boaz, you know, he's a Kingsman Redeemer. Kingsman Redeemer meaning in those days, if you, uh, uh, if you die, if your husband died, your, a relative could marry you to sire children for them. And also just for protection, because as I say, this was a patriarchal society. But Boaz was not the first in line. You know, there was priority given to a certain order. And Boaz was not the first person in line. And Ruth knew that. So why did Ruth go for Boaz? Because she knew there was something. She knew there was a love story brewing there. So she comes to the story and tells Ruth, my dear daughter, I want you to settle. And Boaz is a possibility. So let me tell you, wash yourself nicely, you know, put on your best dress, perfume yourself. And after he has finished win, uh, winnowing, I mean, threshing, in the threshing field, you know, he sleeps there. It was a tradition that they would sleep where they were. 
they were threshing. As he goes to sleep, when he's asleep, go and uncover his feet and sleep at his feet. That was not seduction. It was a tradition. I didn't get a scholar who, they didn't agree on what exactly the tradition was about. But when you read, you, you find a sense at which it was, based, it was a, a cultural practice where you say, take me under your covering. Servants would do that, you know. If your master is sleeping, a servant was allowed to cover themselves with the masters, the end of the masters, you know, garments, you know. So it was basically something like saying, take me under your, you know, your covering, you know, you are my kinsman redeemer, uh, redeem me or something. So Ruth, very obedient. Another telltale sign. You, if you are told, you know, go and semi-propose to a guy who's old, you know, what are the chances you'll jump at it? Unless you like them. So you see my point? I think Ruth, Ruth liked this guy. No hesitation. She goes, you know, and does exactly what she was told. When Boaz sleeps, she goes and, and, and covers herself at the feet of Boaz. And in the middle of the night, Boaz is startled. And she finds a woman at the feet and he's like, who are you? Who are you? You know, and, Boaz, and Ruth says, it's me, your servant, Ruth. You know, and there is an indication that they talked a little bit because it said, I will, Boaz later says, I will do as you have requested me. We are not told exactly what the request was, but basically it's like, you're my king's man, Dima. Maybe, can you consider marrying, I mean, taking me under your cover by marrying me? So the, after that, we are told that Boaz does not hesitate. You know, Boaz again knows that he's not the first in line if he was not interested. He possibly would have said, it's not me who's first in line. Let's give the other guy time. If he does not do anything, maybe in a year or two, you know, I'll consider you. But Boaz is like, as the Lord liveth. You know, if this guy does not take this opportunity, I will jump at it. He says, I'm not the first in line. Tell the truth very clearly. I'm not the first in line. There is somebody who's first in line. If he takes, he wants to take, to redeem you, then let it be so. But if he does not want to redeem you, as the Lord liveth, you know, I shall redeem you. So the next day, so no, Ruth goes home. So at this, at Boaz asks Ruth to sleep and go early in the morning. So in the morning, go, Ruth goes home. Naomi asks what happened. Ruth gives a full account of what happens. And then watch what Ruth says. Ruth says, rest my daughter. This guy will not rest. You know, by the end of today, he will have settled this matter. Why else would he be in a hurry? He loved the chick. So, and sure enough, in the morning, he goes to the gates where the elders would sit and sits there and wait for this first in line, the kingsman redeemer who's first in line. And as God would have it, this guy, or rather this guy suffices, you know, passes there. And Boaz tells him, sit here. And then he goes and brings other elders and brings them there. And he tells this guy, Ruth, Naomi, you know, the widow of Abimelech, is selling her land. And you're first in line to redeem that land. If you want to buy it, please go ahead. And this guy jumps at the idea. Sure enough, you know, I will buy the land and I can see Boaz's heart sinking a bit. But he's a sharp man. He had thought this a little bit. You know, and he says, okay, if you buy the land, you also have to marry uh, the widow of the sons of Abimelech so that you can sire children for them. At that point, this first in line, first kingsman in line, refuses. Why he says, I will endanger my estate. It was such that if this, if you redeem a wife or marry this wife of a late relative and you give birth to children, you have to share your inheritance with these children. So the inheritance his children would have gotten would have been less because of Ruth's children. So he's like, ah, if that is the cost, me, I don't want you go ahead. Boaz does not hesitate. Like this, like this, like this. Marries the girl, gets a baby, end of story. So that is the story. So what title do you think we should go on with? Ruth and Boaz or the love story of Ruth and Boaz? Which one do you think we should go for? I think let's go with. Which have, it really doesn't matter if it's just Ruth and Boaz or the love story of Ruth and Boaz. I want us to look at some lessons. And it applies if it's both. It's not a love story or it's a love story. So the first lesson we can draw from this story is divine connection. Please let's move the slides. Ah, divine coincidence or divine connection. So we are told, let me just read that verse, chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2, verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go 
to the field and pick up the leftover grains behind anyone in whose eyes are fine favor. When Naomi was go when Ruth was going out, rather, she was going to any field. You know, but God directed her steps to land, you know, in the land of Boaz, in the field of Boaz. And then chapter 2, verse 4, it says, just then Boaz arrived in Bethlehem. It's like the author of Ruth, which I think is Samuel, says that just as, wants us to see that there was something. Ruth came and Boaz came, you know. The time really had lapsed because Ruth had worked for some hours before Boaz came. But it's like, that is, it's just then. It's like the author wants us to see, you know, it was one enter sin, another enter sin, you know. So there was a divine connection right there, a coincidence, you know, that both of them found themselves at the same place, you know. Therefore, they could have a conversation. Remember, Ruth was a Moab, Moabite. God, it's like God brought her from a far land, you know, to bring her right where? Boaz, divine connection. But I also want to to, you to think of this. Ruth was in a really bad place in her life. Things were not working out, you know. She's a widow, a widow without a, ch uh, without a child, a widow living with another widow, you know, no covering upon themselves. She had every right to throw herself a pity party. You know, and decide I'm done with life, you know. But that's not truth. We are, she, she still remains selfless, you know. She wants to fend for her mother-in-law. She remains hardworking. She goes serving her mother-in-law, you know, working. And we can see that she was a hardworking person, working hard to make sure that her family now of her and Naomi have something to eat. And I want to speak to us out there who are not married. At times you want to get married at a particular time and things, you know, are not moving the way you want to move and you become preoccupied, you know, by just that fact that you, nobody has come, you have not found the Mr. Right or you have not found the Mrs. Right and it consumes you. What we can learn from this story, don't let it consume you. Go ahead serving God. Go ahead being, being busy serving God and serving other. God has the power to bring somebody where you are. You remember, from up, sorry, he brought, I mean, God brought Ruth right into the field of Boaz. God can bring anybody from India, from Pakistan, wherever God wants, you know. If there is a man there, he has sinned for you, or a woman there, he has sinned for you. He is God, you know. He's a God of divine coincidences, you know. So don't be preoccupied by all this. Just be busy doing what God would have you do, you know. And he, in his own ways, he can bring somebody your way. But having said that, you know, the second thing we can learn from this story is about destiny helpers, or should I say romance helpers. As I, I thought that both Ruth and uh, Boaz, there was something that sparked, but it's like both of them, in my own thinking, talked themselves out, you know. And something that could have been beautiful was about to get lost, you know. A marriage was about to get lost, left to Boaz and Ruth. Boaz was disqualifying himself here, Ruth was disqualifying themselves. Or to say Boaz was being slow, you know. But thank God for destiny helpers like Naomi. Naomi saw that there is a possibility here. And she went out of her, she went out of her way to help these two people, you know, get themselves into this marriage that ended up being significant in the history of the Jews and in the history of the church. Because they gave birth to Obed, Obed who became the father of JC, JC who became the father of King David. You know, so there was a destiny helper. Naomi decided to help. So what can we learn from that? Be open to godly counsel. You know, when you are, when you are told, wash yourself a little bit, perfume yourself a little bit, Put on a little bit better, you know. Don't be hard-hearted, you know. When wise people, and lot is, I say godly advice. There is a lot of nonsense and godly nonsense going out there. Godly advice, you know. If you're in the scene, and I'm talking because I'm also in the courting dating scene, you know. So I'm saying, if you are advised by godly people to do this and to do that, don't be hard-hearted, you know. Listen to that me and Pastor Tabi have been great beneficiary of Mami Sige's advice. Hey, she has spoken to us, you know. And even Pasi, I remember another day we were talking, we were, I was just sharing a story that Aka, about Akagai, you know, and Pasi was telling us, men don't come mid, you know. 
they just come looking funny. You know, you have to do the work. So when you're advised, take the advice. Don't stick, you know, to, to, what you, to what you want to do. Be open to advice and listen and do. And even if it's just not advice, it's practical help, like you're being hooked up by somebody. As long as they are godly people and the intention is clean. I believe it's, we can see it from the story of Naomi. And therefore, it's a godly principle that you can be helped, you know. If they are go and maybe I should add, if they are godly, if you, you as a believer, you know, you know people who you can help. You can see people dating and you just see these two people are going nowhere. You know, you can advise them. You can be their destiny helper or their romance helper. Please help us or help, you know, the people around you. Emma, where is my friend Emma? Oh, damn. I was going to use one of that. <laughs> so I was going to say that you help Emma. Emma is my friend. She's our admin. I was just going to have fun with this someone. But she has escaped. <laughs> anyway, help us the tabs. <laughs> she needs a destiny helper. <laughs> that was on a very light note. So anyway, just help. You know, at times give advice. At times help. You know, you can do divine connections here and there. If, I'm not trying to say make a career out of this. You know, but if you feel that in your heart... It's something, I think it's a spiritual gift, you know. So if you feel that maybe it's a spiritual gift, it is in the Bible. You can be a destiny helper. All right, the third thing we can learn from the story is inner beauty. The, the author of Ruth like, go, goes out of his way to exalt the inner qualities of Ruth. I personally think Ruth must have been a beautiful person. But it's really downplayed. Her outward appearance is downplayed. And what we see as you read that is the inner beauty. Selflessness. That she left everything behind to help a mother-in-law. You know, to come and help somebody who was basically a little bit needy. That she was hardworking. You know. The harvesters comment over in chapter 2 verse 4. You know, just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted uh, the harvesters, verse 6, the, of, after, she, after the boys asked, who, is this, who does this woman belong to? She's a Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She shifts behind the harvester. She came into this field and has remained here morning till now, except for the short rest in the shelter. It's like they were bringing out the hard working. Boaz, you know, when Ruth asks, how come I found favor in your eyes? Boaz said, I have been told about you. How you have done your, uh, what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know. You know, just to come and fend for her mother-in-law. Later on in chapter 3, uh, Boaz talking about uh, Ruth, he says, All the people of this town know that you are a woman of noble character. This author just wanted us to see that this was a woman of inner beauty. She had character. She was of noble character. And it's the same with Boaz. It's very intentional that um, the author tries to make us see that Boaz was a kind man. How she treated Ruth. And what Naomi says after she had Boaz has, has treated, how Boaz has treated Ruth. She says he has, con she, he has continued with his kindness just as he was before. You know, these were people who had the inequality. And uh, just allow me to read a few other verses out of this context. In Proverbs chapter 31, uh, verse 30, you know, we are told that charm is deceitful, deceitful, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Uremo ineza kukudanganya, uremo ineza pita, but a woman who fears the Lord, you know, is to be praised. And then First Peter chapter 3, if you can just allow me to go there, and if you can turn there. 3 verse 3, it says, Your beauty should not come from the outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and wearing of gold and jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of the inner self, the unfading beauty of, the gentle, of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is a great worth in the sight of God. Spiritual as believers, our beauty, we should not concentrate so much on the outward. It does not say we should not. You should not look at a woman and admire or look at a man and admire, you know, in this process of dating and courtship. 
But it says, what we should exalt as a believer. And Makiu, remember we are living in the world where there is a lot of exalting the outward look. You know, we are made to feel even by advertisement. If you just have the right body, you are on your way to success. You know, if you just drive the right car, your problems are solved. That is what the world is portraying. But it should not be for us, so for us. In this process of dating and courtship, you know, and life generally, we, we as believers, we should take pride in the inner beauty. And it's just not for women. I know I've read verses for uh, just talking about women. There is this man in First Samuel chapter 25. First Samuel, yes, chapter 25. Nabal, the wife of Abigail, you know. We are told this man was wealthy. He had a thousand sheep, 3,000 goats. He had camels. But we are told he was mean-spirited and very tempered guy. And we know how Abigail suffered the folly of this guy. You know, so even you men, you know, build your inner, inner character. Be a kind man. Be, have the fruits of the spirit in you. And us as women, even as we get into the dating scenes and the courting scenes, let us not be attracted to men because of how they dress or the size of their wallet. You know, it is not a Christian principle. For us, it is the inner beauty. What we look at is the inner beauty. I'm not trying to say these other things do not matter. You remember we just saw Naomi, Naomi told Ruth to clean herself, dress in her best dress. You know, it has plays its part, but it is not supposed to be the way the world portrays its importance. Definitely not, no. No, and not just us who in a courting scene. Even if you're a parent, you know, you have the responsibility to disciple your children. They live in a world where it's telling them, you know, that if you're not a certain body type, you do not have a certain phone, you know, you do not... You know, outward things. It's just churning of outward qualities. We have to be the ones who will teach our children that. Let your beauty not be. Or the outward adorning of wearing of earrings or hair. or But let it be of inner beauty. We have to talk that gospel. You know, we, let's not be conformed to this world. But let us be transformed by the renewing of the mind. You know, and another guy I like in the Bible is, is Joseph. In Matthew chapter 1, when he learned David, uh, I mean, sorry, Mary, the fiancé, uh, was pregnant. You know, he did not, he, we are told he put, decided to put her aside quietly. That is a good man, you know, a kind man, you know. Those are the things, you know, as Christians, we should be looking for. Last, my time is so fast spent, last, Russia's dealing. In uh, Ruth... After, after Ruth went and uncovered Boaz's feet and Boaz wakes up and finds her there and Ruth says what, no, what she wants or rather maybe Boaz just put two and two together. We are told that uh, Boaz says, uh, although it is true, that is chapter 3 verse 12, although it is true that I am the guardian redeemer of our family, there is another one who is closely related than I. Stay here for the night and in the morning, uh, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So this is Boaz. Boaz wants, you know, to redeem Ruth. But he knows he's not the first. He knows by the law, by law, he's not the first to redeem. So he's like, I really would like, I would really like for this to work out. You know. But if the person who has the first right takes you, it's okay. But in case he's not willing, oh, I am so coming after you. You know, he did not go around and decide, one, Ruth was a woman. You remember, Boaz says, do not go to the field. You know, come to this field because I have told the men not to harm you. By the fact that Ruth was a widow and had no protection, she was vulnerable. Her just going to that threshing floor, you know, Boaz could have taken advantage, you know, of, of her, you know, could have done something to her that night, you know. But he chooses not to do that. He chooses not to play the system. He decides to do this the right way. He goes to the elders, you know, calls this man, and before the elders, he makes the right decision. You know, so righteous dealing. Even us as believers, you know, we know God's standard about life. You know, and now that you're talking about dating and courtship, 
about dating and courtship. It's clear in the, how, in the word of the Lord. He has standards. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. The marriage bed should remain undefiled. Dealing with people respectfully. You know, there is a lot the Bible has to say about dating. You know, let us uphold. Let us uphold that. Because you think you will lose somebody if you don't sleep with them. You know, don't sleep with them. You know, choose to do the right thing other than hold on to something in an unrighteous way. When you generally look, pray, uh, read the story of Ruth, you see the Lord helped them throughout. It's like the Lord wanted them to be together. So he helped them. Divine coincidence, destiny help us. It's just like the Lord helped them. If it is of the Lord, the Lord will help you. Don't take shortcuts, you know. Even if you want to get married and you don't have money and you're thinking there is pressure, do not go for a come we stay. If the Lord is leading, you know, he will make a way for you. You know, righteous decide, I shall do things. I'm a Christian, I shall behave like a Christian. You know, I shall do this thing the right way. Of course, even as I say that, in case you have fallen one way or the other, there is forgiveness. Pick yourself, confess, and come back to to Russia's dealing. As I was telling people in first service, I, I really thought of a, a, a spiritual conclusion for this sermon, but I have none. My conclusion is, if you're in the dating scene as I am, all the best. You know, all the best. If you think by this sermon you're a destiny romance helper, please, we need more of you in this world. Thank you. Thank you.